Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe and I'm in my seventh week of flu. On this edition, Matt Todd talks about open source science and neglected tropical diseases. But first up, here's the news. Chronic fatigue syndrome looks like hibernating. Robert Navio and his team at the University of California, San Diego, have analysed byproducts of metabolism in the blood of people suffering chronic fatigue syndrome, and found that they are quite different from the levels found in healthy people. They claim greater than 90% accuracy in diagnosing people with chronic fatigue syndrome from a blood sample alone. Strangely, some of the metabolic byproducts they found in humans are the same as those produced in roundworms when they go into hibernation due to tough times. The researchers suspect that chronic fatigue syndrome is a result of this kind of protective hibernation process, where resources are being locked away and conserved. Dr Navio and his team looked at blood samples from 45 people who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and also from 39 controls who were free of any chronic fatigue syndrome-related symptoms. They followed the levels of 612 specific chemicals, known as metabolites, which are produced during the day-to-day operations of living cells. They found 40 abnormal levels of the byproducts from 20 different metabolic pathways. The pattern of which metabolites were higher and which were lower than in a healthy person was seen to be almost the exact opposite of what you find in systemic inflammatory conditions such as metabolic syndrome and heart disease. Some of the compounds that are lower than normal are glycosphingolipids that contribute to immune and inflammatory responses in cells as well as signalling in brain cells. Glycosphingolipids are used to make lipid rafts used in the immune response used in an immune response of cells. These lipid lipid rafts aggregate to stop pathogens invading the cell. Unfortunately, there are some bacteria and viruses such as Epstein-Barr that have learned to exploit this defence as a way to infect cells and avoid other parts of our immune defences. Low levels of these metabolites could mean either that the body is making a lot of these lipid rafts to fight a particular infection or that the body is lowering the availability of these compounds so that less lipid rafts are made for these particular infections to exploit. It's too early to tell. People with chronic fatigue syndrome were also low in NADPH, the metabolite from nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, a high-energy molecule necessary to fuel the reactions of cellular respiration. Some of the other metabolites were only low when NADPH was also low. The roundworm, Cynorhabditis elegans, can put itself into suspended animation to conserve resources in the face of threats from reduced food, water or oxygen. The worm can survive this way for months, despite the fact that the lifespan of active worms only lasts weeks. Six of the diagnostic metabolic compounds whose levels are low in people with chronic fatigue syndrome are also low in this protective dower phase of roundworms. Roundworms are amongst the most studied organisms in biology. If it's more than a coincidence that the levels of the same compounds are low, then it might tell us what's going wrong in chronic fatigue syndrome so that we can finally treat the illness. At this point, we don't know if people are reacting to an infection or a toxin that's still present, in which case we shouldn't try to stop the body defending itself, but instead we should find the source of the threat. Alternatively, perhaps the danger is over and we should be restoring normal metabolism so people don't feel sick and exhausted all the time. Either way, a diagnostic blood test for chronic fatigue syndrome with an over 90% accuracy rate would be a wonderful thing when this work is replicated. When put together with the work published earlier this year about the differences in the gut bacteria of people with chronic fatigue syndrome compared to healthy people, it begins to look for the first time like there might be some light at the end of the tunnel 
and this horrible illness will have a treatment available that actually works in the not too distant future. Who knows, it might also tell us about a healthy way to put humans into and out of hibernation for long trips through space. The paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States of America and was titled Metabolic Features of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Associate Professor Matt Todd is doing open source scientific research into malaria. Three years ago, I visited him in his noisy lab at Sydney University with my sound recordist and videographer friend, Adrian Tan. I began by asking Matt, how did he come to be interested in neglected tropical diseases? That's a good question, because I've never suffered from any of these diseases. In my lab, we were looking at some molecules that were useful for these diseases, to treat these diseases. And I got involved in a group in Europe who were interested in schistosomiasis or bilharzia. Uh, and we got involved in the drug that's used to treat that disease. And it was interesting science. But then I went in 2004 to Cameroon, which is a country which is affected badly by schistosomiasis. And there was a conference there, and then my wife and I toured around the country a little bit on public transport and saw some of these areas which are affected badly by this disease. And it was an awful experience to see some of the conditions that these people are living in, which could be alleviated, not completely, but substantial alleviation by this molecule. And that added a huge amount of you know, incentive to continue in that research area, because you saw really what the impact was. You know, we, we attended the opening of a, of a ceremony where children were given this drug uh, as part of a mass administration program. And it was very inspiring to see that. And so, and that naturally led you on to malaria? Yes, it's another dreadful killer, this thing, which can be alleviated, again, to some extent, by very simple molecules given in quantity, which are inexpensive to make. And you just got to find these things. That's the challenge, but it's similarly incredible how much of a difference basic chemistry can make to people's health. Malaria, how many people does that affect, roughly? Oh, it's, well, it's mi- millions of people are affected. A few years ago, the death toll per year was, was approaching a million. Uh, now it's down to about six or 700,000. The tragedy of that number, though, besides the number itself, the tragedy is that most of those are young children. So malaria disproportionately affects children between the ages of, I think, 0 and 5. So it's a really terrible number when you, when you really think about it. And so the progress on this so far, is your focus more on preventing it or treating it? It's treating it. So we're looking at molecules that kill the parasite that lives in the blood. So that means that you don't necessarily want to have the parasite on its own in a lab. You want to have the parasite inside a red blood cell. So you have a, real, a really good assay of whether the molecules you're making would kill the parasite if you, if you took it. And so those are the assays that we use. It's kind of a bit of a change in drug discovery that's happened in the last few years that we have these realistic assays now. So the molecules that we're evaluating in the project have all been through that advanced kind of assay where you know that if the drug is safe and efficacious that it would actually work in an animal. Right, and malaria is caused by a parasite that comes from mosquitoes? Yes, it's, well, it lives in mosquitoes, so it's this cycle. It's this, again, it's, really, it's, it's very easy to become too familiar with this and to not realize how incredible it is that there's this organism uh, which is able to pass between, you know, through us and through another living thing, in this case a mosquito, and is able to pass between the two in this cycle, altering its form in both hosts, right? And passing between is unnoticed by our immune system. It's, it's really extraordinary. It's, uh, it's like a stealth killer in quantity inside your body that you're unable to get rid of. Schistosomiasis is, is similar. There's this, there's this fully fledged organism living in vast numbers inside you and your body doesn't really realize it. So these are, these are highly evolved, very dangerous things which we can sometimes forget about because they're so familiar to us in in, in the world. We read about them all the time, and we forget the incredibleness of the sciences behind it. And how slow is the traditional method of researching these subjects, the traditional method of science, compared to this new open source method of doing science? Well, it's interesting because, of course, in the past, we have the scientific community has done its best to address these problems, and people have worked extremely hard. To, to do science in a certain way to get results. And the results have been really great in the past. I mean, uh, there is a fantastic drug that's used at the moment to treat malaria, 
Unfortunately, resistance is developing, as it always happens, but there, there, are, there have been great drugs, and there is a great drug, which is gradually becoming less effective. But a lot of this research that we're talking about was done before this transformative event, which was the invention of the internet. And it's really an amazing thing. Again, it's overly familiar to us, but it's a really an incredible thing that, is, that speeds up our ability to collaborate way beyond anything we've ever experienced before in the history of our species. So to me, we need to embrace that. Now, a lot of the structures that we use in science, so the way in which we interact with each other, email to some extent, but the way we interact with each other, the way we submit and write, write and submit papers and get those reviewed, the way we write grants and get them reviewed, all of these are traditional structures that were born before the internet. But uh, the internet has come along and has impacted every aspect of human society to some extent except academia, where we still have these processes uh, because we're used to them. And so the Open Source Malaria Project is a little bit about trying to question some of those things, about trying to do science in a slightly different way, which has risks and advantages and disadvantages, but we're trying to use the internet for what it's worth, which is, which is not simply as a source of information, but as a place where you can do research, a place where you can do real science. So you're doing real science and you're drawing in lots more people. Yes, you're drawing in people. Well, we, we do actively draw people in, but also people come to the project. Because it's fully open and because we're very uh, honest about what we can't do, people will come to the project and try and help because it's in our nature to want to do that. A, it's in our nature as human beings. But B, we are all nerds to some extent, right? So you, you want, if you come and, uh, and see something which is being done not as well as you could do it, you can't help but step in and say, well, let me just have a go at that. And, and because it's open, you can do that. You don't have to ask permission to take part in this project. You just have to roll up and contribute. So yes, we're trying to do that kind of model, um, which, which does involve lots more people than a normal project, I think. Well, you get some of these big biology and, and, and particle physics projects, which have 100 people on the paper or whatever. But for drug discovery projects, I guess, uh, you know, our first paper will have more than the usual number of people on it because people have contributed from all different places and universities and industry and all different places. So if you've got people on the internet contributing, how do you maintain the quality of the science? Well, it's partly because it's open that you can do that. Everything that is contributed has to be fully open. In other words, it's not possible to come to the project and say, well, in my lab in South Africa, I've made this molecule. Isn't that great? You can't do that. You have to make the molecule and provide all the evidence that you've done there. So the quality control is buried in there. Of course, that means you have a lot of data, but it's not really possible to you know, fabricate anything because you have to have all of the supporting information that's there. So everything you do has to be backed up by evidence. Uh, that means, of course, that uh, you do have to keep an eye on all of the raw data. And so in, in, our, in our current paper that we're writing at the moment, there's a very large document which has all of the data associated with the first set of molecules that we make. And what is usual is that all of the data will be checked systematically before it's submitted for publication. What we're doing with the open project is, of course, splitting that up and posting fragments of it and asking people to check those. So a crowdsourced checking effort. So if you do check it, you have to put your name to the fact that you've checked it and it's OK. So you can also, if you, if you project manage it a little bit different from, from a regular project, you can, you can also crowdsource the quality control. And does this accelerate the process? Does this make everything faster? Yes, well, the, the process of being open makes things faster because people who are experts on a certain area can come to the project and freely contribute. So the speed of the project is not related to how many people I know, which is, which is quite standard for, for academic projects and industry projects. You work with the people that you know. Sometimes you, you contact people to see if they can help you out. But what you don't in an all project allow, allow to happen is for strangers who are highly qualified to come and help with a problem where you don't control that. So in the schistosomiasis project, the first project, that's what happened. We had a significantly accelerating piece of work was done on that project by um, a company that we did not know existed before we started the project. Now, just to go back to the, the fact that you're doing neglected tropical diseases. So this is an area where there's not that much money in the research? Yes. So there's this thing called, uh, there's a, a phrase of net present value, which is the amount of money that you think that the drug would make. If you, if you made a drug, how much money would you make? And so obviously in something like form, some forms of cancer or uh, obesity, diabetes, the net present value of a drug would be extremely positive because you would expect to make money back on that because it's primarily an affliction of the first world, of the, the developed world. With something like schistosomiasis, where there really isn't that much money in treating people because it's, a, it's, a, because of its demographic, 
then there is a negative net present value. With malaria, it's kind of a sort of zero sum net present value, where you think, well, it's not quite clear if you make money or not. It's not, people are undecided about that. With something like tuberculosis, maybe there's a slightly positive value because a lot of people in the developed world are, are affected by that. So whether you can apply the open source model to other diseases depends to some extent on, on how much money you think you might be able to make. Uh, now, we've, we've obviously started with neglected tropical diseases because there is, there is a market failure there. So th there is no way really to get the pharmaceutical industry spending a lot of resources on solving that problem, because why would they? That's just not their model. Right? With malaria, it's a little bit different because there are companies that are, in, that are researching malaria. There are some that aren't, but there are some that aren't. Uh, and TB, again, there's, there's a pharmaceutical interest in, in that. So it's a little bit sort of vaguer. If we did manage to make a drug for malaria that was effective and was put in the public domain, then, of course, the question would be, well, how, more, how much more positive can we go? You know, could we think about making a drug for cancer or Alzheimer's on the open source model? And there, the question is, uh, is quite heavily involved in economics and politics, as well as the basic science. And peer review, how does, is that something that works differently because everything's online, including your notebooks? Well, it, it does work differently in the sense that everything is continually peer reviewed the whole time. Yes, and in, to, to a very high degree of definition. So individual experiments can be peer reviewed. By peer review, what you normally mean, of course, is when you assemble uh, some piece of work and you put it into an academic paper. And we, we, we do that with the open source project. There's no difference there. It's just that the results are already in the public domain. But writing a, a paper on an open source project is extremely important because you, you've got to be able to say, well, this is a complete piece of work that we think is a full story. And when it's published, it's important that when it's published, that story has been peer reviewed by a couple of people at least. So peer reviewed publication in an open source project is absolutely crucial. Not least because then it describes to people outside the project where we're up to. And how important are students to your discovery process? Well, students, <laughs> students are crucial, whatever. I mean, they're, they're the best. So they're the, they're the feeder of, of much of the experimental work that goes on in the project. So many of the authors on the paper that, that, we're, that we're now uh, just finishing off uh, our students who've made molecules or done biological assays or contributed in other ways. So students in, in, in an experimental discipline like chemistry or biology are the primary driver of all the experimental work. Students also, of course, come to research without some of the preconceptions that maybe the older professors, including me, would, would have. So maybe they're more philosophically agile, or whatever the phrase is. So they're, they're maybe quicker to engage in, in new techniques. And of course, you have to remember that some of our students have grown up in the age of the internet. Right? I remember when the internet was born and I converted to email you know, from paper. <laughs> but some of our students have, 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 uh, have only ever grown up in that environment. So inevitably are more are happier with sharing the details of their daily lives. And that does spill over into research. So, so some students are very happy with sharing the details of their research lives. You know, I mean, it really is interesting that we, we think nothing of taking a photo with a phone and putting it on Facebook and then having a relative five seconds later saying, oh, that's nice, and commenting on it. And yet we don't do that with our research. Why not? Oh, that's a very good question. Obviously, it should happen. And words like agility are something that's often associated with startups. So do you think there's some of that sort of new entrepreneurial ideas there? Because this is a new way of doing things. Yeah. Yes, no, there is. And, and I say that with a, with a laugh because uh, there have been so many times um, in, in the Schisto project and in the, the malaria project, where we just haven't had any idea what to do. Not necessarily with the science, but in how to do the project. How to do an online meeting about strategy, so planning for the next two months. How to have that meeting so that people can contribute. Uh, so we really have spent about two or three years uh, absolutely winging it on some aspects of te technology. And also the philosophy behind the project, so coming up with these six laws that we have for the Malaria Project. That took about a year of, of running the project and realizing what it was that was important about it uh, and what it was that we couldn't really compromise on. So yes, in that sense, I think it has been. It's been a small group, quite a diffuse group with different expertise inside it, really trying to work out how to do this uh, because there was no precedent. So it has, been, it has felt like a startup at times. Yes, I think you're right. And you're talking about being agile. One of those things is, I guess, if somebody from overseas, anyone on the internet who's reading it, so tells you you're doing it wrong and you need to change directions, how hard is that? <laughs> yes, well, no, that's, well, actually, so it is, it is hard. I, I think as, as a scientist, you know, we, we do want to demonstrate that we're good at something uh, and that we're doing something right. Of course, that's a natural human response to something. You want to demonstrate that you're good at something. 
But at the same time, we have to be uh, humble enough to change what we're doing if somebody says you're doing it all wrong. That's exactly what happened on the Shisto project. We, we had a direction at the start of the project, which was defined by a, a sort of a clever academic direction of the project, uh, which was the same as the one that was in the grant proposal that I got funded. So we had to do that. But very early on, it became clear that a, a bunch of people who were watching with, with uh, immense levels of expertise in this particular problem, mainly in industry, said, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. You, you nev it's never going to work if you try and do that. You need to change direction by like 90 degrees and try this other thing, which isn't necessarily academically very exciting. But you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to solve the problem? Or do you want to do you know, something that's academically exciting? We wanted to do both, but we, we, we had to solve this problem. That was the aim. And, and so we changed the direction of the project in response to that. We had to, yeah, I mean, you, you have to think, well, what's more important? You know, the, the getting the science going in the right direction or, or ego. Yes. So you've got to kind of leave the ego a little bit at the door. And, and that's inevitable because you, you want a frank exchange of views <laughs> if you want an open source project. You have to have that. Otherwise, it's, it's, not, it's nothing more than a regular research project. But that wouldn't happen in a traditional scientific process, would it? Because you wouldn't get that criticism. Nobody would know what you were doing. Well, you can do. You, you, I mean, I've been, I've been in research seminars where, of course, people are presenting their research and someone points out some strategic gaffe that's, that's been made. It's pretty rare to do that. And, of course, usually in an academic setting, you describe the research, and then after it's completed, someone will come in and criticize it or review it as a paper or criticize it or suggest a new thing. And by that time, maybe the grants run out. Maybe students have graduated. It's too late. What you want is to really criticize it as it's going on immediately or even before it started to guide the project. And that's what the open source thing allows you to do. You can, you can comment on it whenever you wish. We're, we're very upfront about strategy, about the next 10 molecules we're gonna make in the malaria project. And so if we are about to make a mistake, people can cut us off and, and guide us before we make that mistake. So, I mean, in terms of, just in terms of value for money for, for research funders, it makes sense because you're, you're trying to do the highest quality science you possibly can at all times. And getting the reviewing done upfront before you do it, it helps that. And there's also the matter of publishing negative results. Yeah. So negative results, I think, are results. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I use that word. They're just results. So the, the positive and negative thing, of course, depends on whether or not the results comply with your hypothesis. But results are still results. Uh, and one of, my, one of my biggest motivations for doing open science is that you have the, the positive and the negative. Because if you have both, you're able to build a, a coherent scientific model of something. So in both drug discovery and in my other uh, area that I love, which is uh, catalysis, finding catalysts for new chemical reactions, you simply can't understand the science unless you have both positive and negative. Now, in some research publications, you get the feeling that there is sometimes an emphasis on the positive. That's okay. I understand why people have to present what they've done in the best light. But you need to have all the negatives if you want to, if you want to have a, a, a decent scientific model of something. So that's one of the things I like the most about the open source projects that we're doing is that people are, are free to browse the, the supposed negatives as well as the positives. And when you're using these internet tools, does that make more of a level playing field be between the junior researchers and the more senior people? Oh, sure, yes, that's also great. I mean, I, one of, I, I guess a strategic weakness of, of a, maybe a traditional academic project is that most things will go through the, the senior professor. And sometimes that can be a bottleneck. It, with an open project, it's, it's, yes, it's extremely democratic or meritocratic. So yes, students can correspond with each other directly without, without me involving myself. Of course, I can if I want to do some quality control. I don't have to. And that, that has led to some really tremendous things. Uh, so we, we have had in the past, for example, um, a second year undergraduate student in my lab who, uh, who responded to a, a question about the project from a professor of medicinal chemistry in Melbourne. And she, she did this without my input. So she took the question, read the relevant research papers, and, and rebutted the criticism it was constructive criticism of the project in a way that the professor thought was very good. And during that conversation, it didn't matter who was who. Right? It really didn't matter. It was just names on a blog, and people were having a very constructive conversation about the science. There wasn't a sort of artificial level of respect or fear. It was just people talking. And similarly, in, in the malaria project, one of the, uh, the, there's, a, there's a PhD student now, a postdoc in Edinburgh called Patrick Thompson, who has made molecules and, con and contributed those to the project without really asking and, and doing it in a way that was immensely constructive, right? Uh, it didn't matter who this guy was. He was producing quality data, doing quality science. Uh, that's what mattered. You know, it didn't matter who he was in, as a person. 
That was part one of Associate Professor Matt Todd from Sydney University talking about open source research into neglected tropical diseases. Listen next week for part two. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, standing ovations, helpful suggestions, and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Look at the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the Community Radio Network, including 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website www.diffusionradio.com That's www.diffusionradio.com And check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.